to the Avid Knits podcast. My name is Sarah and you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry both as Avid Knits. Um, today is Friday, a day, April 3rd. Um, and it is, it's usual cloudy, humid, semi breezy self here in Houston. Um, and hi, it's been a really long time. <laughs> Normal viewers of the podcast will know that pretty much every episode I start out with, I meant to do this earlier, but, and usually but is followed by dot, 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 I didn't. There's not usually a reason. There's not usually an excuse. I'm not really big on excuses, so I will just tell you that I didn't. <laughs> um, which, you know, look on the bright side. At least you know that I'm being sincere. Because if I wasn't being sincere, I would have made up something. I apologize for that edit. Um, my sweater is quite warm. It is cool in my house, but now that I'm podcasting, apparently I'm nervous. I don't know why I'm just talking to myself. Uh, so turn on the fan. Um, hi guys. It's, a. Uh, it's been a week. Um, it's been longer than a week for all of us, but for me particularly, it's been, it's been a long week. <laughs> So I'm going to get into that at the end, and I am going to warn you that I might cry. <laughs> uh, I'll try really hard. So um, yeah, if you want to hear kind of what's been going on in our household, that's going to be at the end. Um, everybody's fine for the most part. Uh, nobody's sick um, or anything like that. So uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll know um, that we, we, lost, we lost a pet. We lost our and uh, so I'll talk about that at the end and uh, try really hard not to cry throughout. <laughs> so hi guys, it's really great to be back. Um, I typically live a pretty quarantined lifestyle. Like, this is pretty much normal for us, but um, usually by Friday I'm kind of I'm kind of done. Um, so we usually take Fridays, as I've said before many times, we usually take Fridays to uh, go to our local brunch place and have some waffles if there's any homework that we didn't finish during the week, because we do homeschool typically. Um, if there's any homework we didn't finish, he gets to do it there. It's a nice way for us to chat and socialize. We're regulars at our place. Everybody knows us. Um, and usually we hit Target or something. Uh, maybe he gets a toy for the week or every other couple of weeks. Just depends on, on how we did and... If there's any errands that I need to run, or um, if I'm looking for something crafty to do, like we'll pop into Michael's. Like we just kind of get out on Fridays. Uh, and then my husband comes home on weekends and he generally works 10 to 12 hours a day. So, you know, for weekends, he usually needs to rest, but he really hates the idea of just staying home because wow, free time. So our weekends are usually really busy and we live in a food capital and a city with a million and one things to do. And we love to take advantage of that. So quarantine has been, it's been a lot of housework. <laughs> the honey-do list is getting progressively shorter and running out of things to make him do. Um, but we are uh, very fortunate. My husband's job is considered essential, so he is still working. Um, he does not work in medical, so we are super grateful for those of you who do work in medical or for anybody that you know or have family who might be working in medical please 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 pass along our gratitude that is amazing and such hard work such hard work okay um i know that everybody comes on to podcasts for lightheartedness and a little bit of an escape um i'm not going to inundate you with a bunch of bad news uh but i i really have a hard time with that. Um, I agree that we all need a break to a certain extent, but it seems really irresponsible to pretend like this isn't happening because it is. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about kind of our, I don't know, we'll chat about COVID at the end, at the end, I think. Um, I'm not gonna give you any horrible statistics, but you know, we'll just chat. <laughs> Bird and Blend Tea. Thank you, Hannah. Corner of Craft. Follow her if you don't. She's great. Um, gingerbread chai. I use a little bit of sugar and a little bit of um, almond milk in mine. 
and it's quite amazing. Chai is my favorite tea, I would say. I would, I'm, I'm a big chai fan. Um, but I got a five pack sampler from them um, and I got some stuff that I really didn't think I would like that I was really into. So like they have one called Cherry Bakewell um, and uh, Chocolate Digestives. I don't really like chocolate in my tea. I'm not really a sweets person. But both of those were really, really nice. Had kind of a, kind of the same spicy, not spiciness. Um, Bird and Blend does really well with their teas. They're not overly spicy. They're not overly sweet. And usually whatever they say on the package is pretty much exactly what it tastes like. The Cherry Bakewell was really good. I am not an artificial cherry flavor person. I don't really like cherries, to be honest. Uh, but the Cherry Bakewell was really, really nice. It was um, just enough to give you um, in, in homage to your sweet tooth, you know, but not enough to knock you down, which was fantastic. <sighs> if you hear any child laughing or if I giggle randomly, my son is watching Spies in Disguise in the front room. We have seen it 11 billion times. I think we watch it on loop. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, if you have not seen it, it is Tom Holland who plays the, uh, young Spider-Man in Marvel Universe. So he's like, the Iron Man, Spider-Man, like that kid. Uh, he's also in um, Onward, which is with Chris Pratt, who is also in the Marvel Universe, which is really funny because there's a bunch of jokes saying that um, basically Tom Holland can't be sent anywhere without an Avenger. And so there's like a list of Tom Holland movies where he's with one of the cast members of the Avengers or whatever. Anyway, long story short, Spies in Disguise is Tom Holland and Will Smith. It is utterly hysterical. I highly recommend it. Um, it's great for all ages. The jokes really hold up and it is um, about a young kid who basically graduates MIT at 15 and um, how he wants to make the world a better place by not using um, bombs and how uh, if you're in charge of saving everyone, you should save everyone and not just who you think are the good guys. And it was just, it's really heartwarming. It's a really, really cute movie. It's really hysterically funny. Um, I really recommend it. And Reba McIntyre plays the director of the spy agency that they work for. <laughs> and it's just really, I don't know, her voice just cracks me up. I love her. Okay. Um, elephant in the room. Hi, Sharon, because I'm sure she's watching and she's probably her and her husband, I'm sure, glaring at me. So okay, last episode, you will know that I talked about, I finished the Oster sweater, which was the cabled green monstrosity, call it my green monster. Um, that I knit for the Modern Skein and uh, Red Stag Fibers um, out of 100% BFL uh, in the colorway Glass. And Glass is this beautiful, beautiful dark green. It's fantastic. It's over dyed a little bit with black. It's got tons of dimension and personality to it. And this is the sweater. Um, I did not have it on hand because I turned it in. I was on deadline. I turned it in before I podcast. Um, but fortunately for me, it's too long. Uh, Josh doesn't like it. He says it's too long. He uh, doesn't like the length. Excuse me, he loves the sweater, but he doesn't like the length. He asked if I would shorten it up. And I said, of course I will. And this is part of my plan to not have to give it back because it's in my house, Josh, and I live in Cyprus. So when you want to drive an hour to see me, you can come steal it. But until then, okay. I'm totally lying. I'll give it back to them next week. <laughs> it's fine. But I figured because you hadn't seen it, and it is in my possession and in my house. And I love it. Oh my gosh. Like I would podcast with it so that I would have an excuse to wear it for a little bit before I have to give it back. So thank you for your generosity, guys. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, if you have not used Red Stag or you've never heard of it, uh, Josh is relatively small. Um, I really recommend it. His new BFL base is phenomenal. And uh, I am very, very much trying to wiggle my way into a deal with Sharon where I can work for trade so that I can get some of this. It's purely selfish. I just want some of this yarn so that I can make myself a sweater. <laughs> so anyway, this is the Oster. I'm not going to get all the way up. It is supposed to be knit in pieces and then seamed, um, like all Brooklyn tweed patterns. Um, sorry, uh, Michelle Wong. Michelle Wong is a designer. She was knit for Brooklyn tweed. Um, I don't like to do that. I'll admit it. I'm just lazy really is what it comes down to. So um, I knit in the round up until the armhole split and then I did the front and the back separately and then I seamed the, seam, the, the sleeves and stuff together. So it turned out really wonderfully. I'm super proud of it. I did find a drop stitch on the cuff uh, the other day so I marked that. I don't know how that happened. Because you knit from the cuff. Uh, like you knit from here up. Like how in the heck I dropped a stitch in the middle. 
I don't even know. But I'll fix that, obviously, before I give it back. Um, I have also been looking at the cuffs because, you know, we have to point out our imperfections. I've been looking at the cuffs, and this is a tubular cast-on. And I think what I'm going to start doing is provisionally casting on at the sleeve and then knitting my sleeve and knitting back down for the cuff because I find my sewn bind-offs to be a lot neater than my cast-ons are. And I know that I should probably just practice until they get better, but I don't know. It seems... Yeah, this is what I... This is my job. Like, this is what I do. And so it seems to me that I should just make my life easier. So next time I think I will do that. The cuffs are fine. They, they, they're fine, but they don't come in quite... They don't come back in quite as much as I would like. So I've been debating on whether or not I'll cut those off and redo those too. Hi, guys. Let me think. Um, I have one finished object to share with you. Don't get excited. It's not huge. I did finally suck it up and finish the baby sweater. This is the Flax Light by Tin Can Knits. I knit it in Madeline Tosh Sock. Yeah, Mad Tosh Sock in the birch gray color colorway. And I'm really pleased with it. It turned out really cute. I did choose to do the little arm details because it is such a plain sweater. I thought that that would be a cute little touch. Um, I'm sure not all of them have it, but my skein seems to have um, had some pink with it at some point or in a dye pot or something. I have little um, little pink dibs, it dips in it every now and then, which I don't mind. I think is super cute. Um, baby is genderless as of now. Baby was due on the 28th and is overstaying. And my uh, girlfriend has decided to charge baby double rents and uh, serve a, a certified letter, <laughs> which is being ignored right now. So she has not had baby yet, which is convenient for me. Because my first work in progress is actually a sweater for mom. So my friend Camille, I've talked about, is having her first baby. Baby is overdue, taking its time. That's fine. Do what you do, baby. This is Camille's sweater. It is just a very, very plain um, gray sweater. It's a little bit oversized. It's called the Svelia. It is in lane issue five. Um, and Svelia is done by... Beranger Caillou. 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 It's French. I'm not sure how to pronounce the end of that. Um, but it's... A... Sorry. I meant to show you a picture. <laughs> it's just a really beautiful throw-over um, sweater with a v-neck. It is supposed to have a mohair lace piece in the v-neck. I'm sorry. I'm trying to find that. I, don't, I should have marked the page and I didn't because I'm smart. Uh... This is such a pretty issue. I love I love Lane. I'm so sad that they're not making magazines anymore, and I really hope that they come back to it. So this is the sweater. It has a little um, mohair plate piece on the v-neck. I probably will not do that. That's not really Camille's style. I'll just leave the v-neck. I'll do a really shallow one. Um, so yeah, I have to knit 15 inches on the body. I am on 12 and some change. I was joking with her last night, I said, you know, 15 inches is taking forever. And basically, I'm going to stop thinking about it, and then I'm going to look down in, like, a you know, half hour, and then I'm going to be at 17 inches and be annoyed because I have to take it out. <laughs> um, although I'm sure she would be fine if I left it at 17. She likes a really oversized sweater, so. I'm knitting that on size three needles. I use Chow Goose for everything. Um, I don't own another set of needles. Um, if you're looking for a needle set, uh, metal Look for a metal needle set. I can't give you any higher recommendation than Chow's. Um, cost, uh, the way that they're made. I've had a lot of mine for over five years, and um, I've never had to replace one. I've never had a join that didn't work. I have nothing, no problems. Um, I do also use the little mini twists for socks. Let me see if I can find one. Oh, it's one of these. Okay, so they're super tiny, super thin. The um, normal... The normal red lace cable, that's not going to work, sorry guys. Um, the normal red lace cable looks like that, um, is the bottom one, and then I use the mini twist. I have one set of these that I did not pay much attention to, and I stuck, uh, I have a habit of sticking the 
needles into the bowl. Um, and I have one that has kinked kind of like this. Um, it, ha it has not stopped it from being useful. It hasn't changed the join or anything like that. It's just kind of misshapen by looks, but it doesn't affect my knitting. So uh, I'm not really concerned about it. Um, so my second work in progress is for my husband, because I've been promising him a sweater for a couple of years and I just haven't found the right combination of yarn and stuff. So I am knitting him the Redford by Julie Hoover. It is also a Brooklyn Tweed pattern. It is also supposed to be knit flat and then seamed, and I am not doing that because it has a front, a back, and two side panels. And then basically the way that you knit it, it or you seam it is like with one stitch allowance, which means that you have edging on your flat pieces. And when you put your flat pieces together and you seam them, instead of it being a flush seam, you have um, a ridge. So it looks like an exposed seam. I'll put a picture here so you can see it. He um, likes the feature, is not adamant that it has the feature. Um, and there's really no way to replicate that in the round. People have said that they do it. They've um, said that they're going to knit it in the round. I've seen a lot of project pages, but nobody talks about how they deal with that. So I need to do a little bit more research on that. Um, I'm just kind of giving it a pearl, a pearl bump right now, um, like a twisted pearl to see if that'll pull it out as far enough. I'm not very far into it. I'm just a couple of rows. Sorry. Obviously, I'm just a couple of rows. I'm knitting it in cast iron, which is a colorway from Brooklyn Tweed. This is Loft. It's amusing to recommend it yarn for once. So we'll see. Um, I'll do a few more rows and see what happens and then uh, figure out if I want to change that or how I would like to do it. I like the exposed seam. I think it looks nice. Um, I'm just having trouble replicating it in the round. Uh, yeah. I have a lot of works in progress. So anybody who's been watching the podcast for a while, you'll know that I typically only have two, typically have two sweaters going and then maybe um, a sock. I have a sock in the car, sorry, wasp, um, outside my window. Um, I have a sock going in the car, but I haven't worked on it at all. Um, I took it with me yesterday. I had a doctor's appointment. I thought I might get a couple rows down, but I didn't, I didn't even bother picking it up. So I have um, four, four works in progress right now, uh, three, and then one I need to just cast on. Um, my third work in progress is, I have not been talking about bags. <laughs> I'm a terrible, I'm a wonderful podcaster, you guys. This bag is Fat Squirrel Fibers. Um, Amy Beth, she also has a podcast called Fat Squirrel Speaks, if you don't watch her cut me, just t shut me off and go over there. She's hysterical. Um, I am knitting a ripple crop top by Jessie May. Um, it is tangled. Um, I have to knit five inches of this. I will probably knit six or so. I'm about halfway there. I think it's almost four probably. I'm knitting it out of life in the long grass in the cantaloupe color. Um, which is extremely accurately named, and these little tiny speckles of green are just making making everything so much better for me. Um, so I have two skeins of that. I am alternating. I'm using helical knitting to do that, and that is working itself right along, I guess. Um, my coffee bag is Luna Pie Designs. It, it opens into a box bag. It has a, a wire right in here, and so it opens up really nice for you. I really like those. I have two of those bags. Oh, you'll see the other one in a minute. This one is Women in STEM. It is by my girlfriend Mar Mariah, and she is Knitted Niceties. I'm not actually sure if she sells online. Mariah, every time I talk about you, I say this, and you would think that I would ask you since we talk, like, all the time. Um, but I am really positive that you could just send her a message, and she would be happy to make you something. Um, and then my fourth work in progress, which is not really quite in progress yet, but has plans, is also in a Luna Pie Designs bag, and it is going to be knit out of this gorgeousness. This is Shelter, Brooklyn Tweed Shelter, in the plume colorway, and it's this beautiful, beautiful purple with um, reds and lighter purples and a couple of little blue pieces. Um, I have a swatch... 
my little swatch basket. I have a candle going. I want to make sure I didn't drop anything in it. This is um, the swatch that I made. Uh, I, I need to go down a needle size. This is um, going to be the Offshore V-neck by Bristol Ivy. I'll put a pad or a picture here. Um, and I'm going to be absolutely blunt with you. It's one of her earlier ones, and I have to tell you, the pattern, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. Uh, <laughs> It has nothing to do so much with the pattern writing, but so much like, so much as the way that the pattern is written. written. So there's a lot of um, commentary about how some of the neck pieces on the back, it has two cables that come from your neck and over your shoulders and then down your sleeves. And then the front is actually cabled. Um, and there are a lot of people who discuss that the directions for the neckline aren't super clear. Um, I haven't quite seen that yet, but I do know that the way the charts are set up is really annoying. So for instance, let me see if I can mirror this. You'll have chart A here and chart B here. But since you read a chart from this side over, you're having to start in the middle of this one, wrap around to the back of that one, and then come back across. It's really aggravating. Um, but, you know, whatever. I, I can do it. Um, I guess I could uh, cut it out and then, like, scan it and create my own chart, I suppose, if I really, really wanted to. But... I'll see what happens and maybe I'll get around to that and maybe I won't. <laughs> anyway, I really want the sweater. So I will do that. Okay. Yeah, that's all my works in progress and stuff. I have a candle burning. I don't know if you can see it. I can't remember whenever I set up. And it is from Wax and Wool. If you've never used their candles, their candles are not very in your face. And this has been really, really nice. So this is Potions. I got this in my advent calendar from Dragon Horde Yarn. Um, you picked what house you were and based off of your house depended on what candle you got. Um, if you can't tell, I am a Slytherin. Um, so this is the first time I've been able to burn that. Uh, dog, because of the dog. Um, the dog uh, candles really aggravated his allergies and gave him lots of gunks in the eyes and I just always felt bad. So I just never really burned anything. So I have quite a few candles around my house I'm getting to actually use. Um, Yeah, I think I think I'm about done with stuff. Um, I have a couple of acquisitions, and by, yeah, a couple of acquisitions. Neither of them are yarn. So if you would like to stay for that, that would be wonderful. I'd be happy to show them to you. The first acquisition that I want to share with you is um, actually holds an. Uh, includes an older acquisition and then a newer one, one that I never showed. Um, and I'm not positive how these will show up because of the glare through the window. So if they're absolutely terrible, I will edit this part out and I'll just put pictures so that you can see them. Um, I was watching Molly of a Homespun House a couple of months ago, a few months ago, and she had posted a piece of artwork that she bought off of Etsy from a designer, from an artist, excuse me, called Giada Rose. And I do not have one of her cards handy. Yes, I do. Hold on. So this is her card, Giada Rose. She does um, illustrations and handcrafts. She is Rose Witchery on Instagram. And my last order, I got this really sweet coven of witches that came in the thing. She actually does have a painting of this, and it is really adorable. She has a couple of pieces that I really wanted. But um, I purchased this one first, um, and it is two stags, or I think I think they're elk, but I'm going to go with that. Um, they're two elk with uh, moon phases strung between them. I'm really hoping that you can see this, because it's going to be very sad if you can't. Um, and so I purchased that one first. And I've really loved it. It took me forever to get it framed because the art paper that she sent it on was like eight and a nine by eight and three quarters or so, nine by nine, some really weird frame size. And I was like, no, this is, I don't know what to do, blah, 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 blah. And then I was like, Sarah, you mat it. And then that way it cuts out the edges and it looks really pretty. <laughs> so I went to Michael's and I got an eight by eight opening and it, ta da, it worked fine. Sometimes not the smartest thing to the shit. So, and then, so I put that on my wall and I was looking at my yarn room and I had this giant picture window in the middle of my yarn room. And so on either side, I was like, I put one on this side next to my yarn shelf and it looks really nice, but I have something else on the other side and I wasn't loving it. 
was like, well, you know what I need? I need another one of Jada's paintings. <laughs> she has one called The Lantern Parade, maybe? I'm gonna send you to her site to look at it. Basically, it's um, a young lady and then I believe it's children and they all have lanterns and they're walking through a field and it's just beautiful. But I don't have anything in my yarn room or in my house even that depicts people. So I felt that that wasn't something that I really wanted to go with. I don't know why. I'll probably buy it later. <laughs> Let's be real. Um, so I bought this one, which is a house in the woods uh, on, under a mountain. And if you look really closely, if you can, because I don't know how the glare works, the house has chicken legs. It's Baba Yaga's house. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Baba Yaga is a Russian fairy tale about a witch who lives in the woods. Um, she uh, is not often depicted to be very kind, <laughs> but I really loved it. I thought that was great. So I got that. Um, and so those have gone on either side of my window. Um, I have another picture that I received here. Or I finally got a frame for, I mean, um, but I don't have the matting for it and I haven't put it together. And so I'm going to save that one for you until I get that done. My other acquisition was this sweet little thing. Instagram knows me really well. And so, you know, Instagram does those sponsored ads and just randomly suggests things to you. Well, I've been looking at this for like three months and haven't bought it and haven't bought it and haven't bought it. And I finally gave up. This is Heidi from The Clever Clove. And this is her little card that she sent and she has super cute little characters. And I bought this darling little thing. So for those of you who don't know, this is a Highland cow or a Highland coo. And he is a sock knitter, apparently. And I'm super, super in love with it. And it's just adorable. <laughs> yeah. So this is their uh, her Instagram and her website. She has a lot of really cute, sweet stuff. Um, I highly suggest that you go look it out. This is a really nice pin, by the way. This is a very sturdy pin. I like, really, really like it. Um, yeah. My final acquisition isn't really an acquisition, but it was a gift. And it was very, it was very, very wonderful. It was very wonderful. So um, my bestie is uh, one of, rather, I'm one of hers. I don't know how many she has. I know she has at least two. Hi, Jacqueline. <laughs> um, Julie of Sweet Sparrow Yarns in uh, New York. And she is an absolutely fantastic human being. If you guys don't have a Julie, I recommend it. I don't know how I've made it 34 years without having a Julie. She's, she's wonderful. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, this is tear jerker time. So be ready. <laughs> uh, not this, not this Tuesday. It just went by, but the one before, um, my, I have, a, I had a, I have a 12 year old lab and he, uh, has been limping really heavily on the left front leg for uh, about a month and a half or so. And so uh, five weeks ago or whatever. Anyway, about a week after we noticed it, we took him to the vet and the vet said, well, you know, maybe it's just, he's old. He's like 12, you know, he's, he's old. And so I'm gonna, you know, we'll do uh, Novox, which is an anti-inflammatory and a pain reliever. And we'll see how he gets on. And I said, okay. And over the ensuing four weeks or so that he was on that medicine, his left shoulder, his limping pretty much resolved itself, but his left shoulder ballooned. And so we took him back in after the no box and I was like, uh, or we, so after he ran out of the no box, a couple of days later, he was limping so badly. He was having trouble putting his foot down. So I made an appointment for Friday. Um, because he has, uh, the vet that he sees only takes appointments on Thursdays and Fridays. Uh, Friday was more convenient for me. I am capable of lifting my dog, but when he's, struggling he's 85 pounds um it when he's hurting or he's struggling I can't manipulate him as well as my husband can so it's a lot easier to have my husband go with me and so he set up the appointment and Boomer was fine just hanging out and um and he's sleeping a lot and wasn't you know but he could get himself outside to use the restroom he could come into the other room where you were he was okay so we felt comfortable waiting a couple of days to get him some some major pain relief we have uh some pain relievers that were left over from uh, surgery and the vet said go ahead and just use that so we were doing that so on tuesday um i let him outside i encouraged him my normal morning with my dog my husband gets up at five to go to work he lets my dog out 
dog comes back to bed. I get up at 8.30, I feed dog, dog goes outside, dog comes back inside, dog goes back outside, dog comes inside. <laughs> uh, usually he's outside three to four times a day. Um, and you know, we'll play inside or outside. He's older, so he doesn't need a whole lot of that kind of attention. Well, Monday and Tuesday, he wasn't getting up with my husband. And so we were like, okay, well, we know he's hurting, but he was getting up at 10 or 11, you know, and going outside to do his thing and eating and whatever. He was still eating. He was just a little slower than normal. So on Tuesday, I told my husband, I'm going to move his appointment up. Can you come home early tomorrow on Wednesday? Can you come home early? And um, that way I can get him in because he's having a lot of trouble. I said, yeah, of course, no problem. Well, a couple of, like that was at noon at two thirty that afternoon. I finally encouraged my dog to go outside to go use the restroom. He got out there. He did it. He was coming back up the patio. We don't have stairs or anything. It's just, it's just flat concrete. Um, and I think from here to the grass is maybe six feet. Uh, and he got out there, he did his thing and he was halfway back and he just stopped. And, um, you know, when your cat gets really pissy, they do that arched hunchback thing. Well, that's what my dog was doing. And he couldn't, he was like walking on his toes and he couldn't put his feet down. He was having a lot of trouble. So, um, I got a beach towel, I made a sling, I helped him get back inside and he laid down on the floor and he yelped. My dog is a very, uh, has a lot of pain tolerance. Um, when he was younger, he ate, uh, the tassels off of the end of a rope and had four inches of rotted intestine, um, before he even stopped eating. So the vet was like, he should have been in absolute misery for the last two weeks and he didn't act any different at all. So he has a very high pipe to pain tolerance. So for him to lay down and, and yelp was a huge deal. And I called my husband and he didn't answer because he is at work, obviously, and he runs a machine. So having your phone is not a deal because you don't want to be distracted. So I called his office. They got a hold of my husband. I called him. I was like, you need to come home. Uh, he has to go now and I can't take him. My husband took off early and he came home. Um, they carried him in or they put him on a table to wheel him in to the vet's office. And then for some reason, they let him walk himself back out. Um, and I know that they were hoping that that was a sign that the mobility was coming back, but they had to give him a, I'm sorry, I'm telling this in like the worst way ever, but this is the first time I've told the story. So bear with me. When we took him to the vet, uh, the vet, uh, was a different doctor and that's fine. Uh, and she was adamant he had x-rays because his shoulder was really swollen. And so I fully agreed with that. And she gave him, he was in so much pain that they weren't sure they would be able to manipulate him in order to get the x-ray. So they gave him a sedative, uh, and they call it a twilight sedative. So what that means is they don't put your, they put your dog unconscious, but they can pull him right back out of it. So it's not a dose where then they have to wait for him to wake up automatically they're able just to kind of put him down and bring him back uh and she did that and then he was able to walk himself back out he was limping a lot obviously but i mean he was able to walk himself back out they sent him home with some more novox thinking that maybe him coming off of that was just um exacerbating this problem and she called me and she said um i have biopsy it but I'm in a 95% positive that what he has on his shoulder is uh, a cancer. It's, it's a cancerous growth and it's either attached to the cartilage or it's bone. Uh, it will metastasize. You don't have an option. So I can give you the number to an oncologist and he can discuss treatment with you. But in this case, typically in treatment is surgical amputation. He has it in both front shoulders, but the left one is the worst. And she's like, I don't know where you want to go with that. And I told her flat out, you know, no, I'm I, more power to you if you choose to do this. But my dog is 12. He is, um, has been slowing down a lot. Uh, he is not going to, he would not have recovered from <laughs> uh, an amputation of one of his legs. I mean, even when he was limping, he wouldn't just hold it up and hop. Like that's just not who he was. He would consistently try to walk on it. So trying to watch him trying to uh, have him rehab with only three legs. I don't feel like he would have uh, responded well to that. And so I told her, I was like, no, you know, that's not, that's not something we want to, we want to look at. Um, honestly, we just want him to be comfortable. We want him to be comfortable and able to get himself inside and out. And we will keep him, we will, we will be happy to do whatever we have to do to make that happen as long as he is happy and comfortable and wants to do that. Um, and she said that she thought that was that was the right idea, the right plan. Well, we got him home and he wouldn't get back up and he wouldn't get back up. He wouldn't get back up. And so I called Wednesday and I was like, look, um, we're having to basically carry this 85 pound dog outside. Um, he won't eat. 
he won't drink water and he won't use the restroom. Like what's going on? And they were like, well, he could just be having um, an adverse reaction to the sedative. It took him a couple of days to get his legs after he had um, a dental and a growth removed a couple of months ago. They were like, maybe he's just not responding. Like he'll be given 24 hours. And then this afternoon, let us know. And it just kind of went downhill from there, guys. He um, would lay flat on his side and he wasn't able to roll himself up onto his elbows or his shoulders. My husband was having to take him inside and outside. He wouldn't ever use the restroom. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't drink. He wouldn't anything. Um, so he did that Wednesday. We took him Wednesday and they put him on a stretcher uh, and they carried him in and then they carried him back out on the stretcher. And she admitted, the doctor told me, she was like, I'm really concerned about the fact that he's deteriorating. Like, I, that's not, doesn't make me comfortable. Um, Thursday, uh, so basically Wednesday, oh, he had been really, really, really nervous Tuesday night and, like, kind of panicking. And uh, so I told her about that, and she gave me some uh, trazodone to help with his anxiety. And we brought him in some, tram you know, he had tramadol for the pain or whatever. And so she was like, here, you know, I'll give you this. And he finally slept Tuesday night, Wednesday night, he finally slept Wednesday night. Um, but you could just see, like, he lost control, uh, he, he wasn't able to get up, so then he lost control of his back legs, so when he would try to put his feet down, his feet would curl under, he wasn't putting the bottom of his foot down. Uh, he couldn't stand up on his own, he had to be held, uh, and then Thursday morning I woke up and he was having trouble, like, if he wasn't in the perfect position, then his breathing got really labored, and anyway, anyway, Thursday I made the call. Uh, we had an appointment and we said we said our goodbyes and so the last week has sucked <laughs> this is the first time in 12 years that I have not had an animal um, I'm only 34 so I got my dog when I was 22 uh, that my, my entire adult life has been with this one animal and uh, a lot of you know that you know I was widowed when I was 27 um, so like I had my dog before I was married I had my dog before I had kids I had my dog before I had my own place like I mean I had my own place but my adult life. Uh, it was right out in the military. Um, your pets, when you go through trauma, when you go through trauma, your pets are there for you, but they're also, I find kind of a safety box. So like, you know, you're right in your diary, how you're feeling. They know the best and the worst person that you have ever been, the, the highest and the lowest, because you feel safe with your pet to allow them to see those things or to, or they end up being the ones on the brunt end of it, you know? Um, so having to say goodbye to him has really brought out a lot of uh, previous emotional issues, which is fine. It's fine. I'm, I'm doing a lot better. It's been a week. Um, but yeah, it's sucky. It's been really hard. <laughs> um, back to my friend Julie. Julie had recently um, lost one of her kitties and I uh, did a, a, I tried really hard to be there for her for that and um, she says I succeeded but I mean it's hard when you live across the country um, but anyway Julie when um, I lost Boomer obviously uh, kind of knows where I'm at and so she thought that I could use a distraction and we've never talked about it I don't think but this is my all-time favorite movie. My dad's favorite movie was The Princess Bride. And I have been able to quote it backward and forward since I was probably six. Um, I've never read the book. I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> I've never read the book. And Julie bought me this absolutely beautiful illustrated version of my all-time favorite story. And she said that the only thing that she's ever, she has ever liked more than the book or the more than the movie is this book specifically. So, um, let me see if I can find you an illustration that, um, yeah. So it is, um, illustrated in a very, very nice manner. It is an absolutely beautiful, uh, edition, a beautiful book. Um, and if you have not read The Princess Bride or seen The Princess Bride, I, uh, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's just good, solid fun. It's, it's not, uh, emotionally taxing. It's not a heartstring thing. It's purely this love story with, uh, what does he call it? S. Morgan Stern's classic tale of true love and high adventure. 
And so the story of this book, for those of you who don't know, and they talk about it in the movie, the story of this book is that the author is William Goldman. He is the one who abridged it. And so when he was 10, when his father was 10, his grandfather read it to him. When William was 10, he got pneumonia and his father came in and read it for, to him. And they are from a country called Florin and um, his father's English was really terrible. Uh, and he says that one of his, like, he was a sports kid throughout, video games, sports, had to go, had to be doing, hated to read. And that all changed when he got so sick and his father read him a book. And so he read him the original book and William was in love with it. Bill. Bill was in love with it and he found it to be abs an absolute treasure. And when he tried to get his son to read it for his 10th birthday, his son just couldn't get into it. And he couldn't, he kind of was really hurt by it and couldn't really figure it out. He opened up the book and realized that like the second chapter, like where they're talking about the prince, it's like so-and-so begat this and had that and this prince came next. And it was just this almost satirical version or vision of what life was like in, in foreign society and, and stuff like that. And he realized that his father when he read it to him in his broken English had cut out all of the boring parts and had only read the adventure stuff for his kid. And so he made it his mission to abridge the book. And uh, that's what this is, is all of the great stuff from this classic story. That's uh... so yeah, anyway, um, I have this book. It makes me smile a lot and I'm really excited. Um, so I've been reading, uh, I, I am a very fast reader. I could read this entire book in a day, but I've been trying to pace it, and so I've been reading 40 minutes or so with my morning coffee um, over in our uh, living area, where like our formal area where nobody ever really goes. Uh, it's one of my favorite rooms in the house. Just trying to be nice to myself, I guess. <laughs> Morning uh, Mornings are a lot calmer for me now, so... Yeah, it's been kind of lonely and it kind of it kind of bites and the COVID thing hasn't been awesome. Um, I had was not going to talk about this because I don't really like to talk. I don't talk about a lot of personal stuff. I talk about stuff that happened in the past. I talk about um, things that might have happened in us or I usually talk about other people. Like if you really pay attention, I'm very, very, very private about how I feel about certain things. Um, but one of the thing that I do want to bring up here, and because I think it's so important that we educate, because I live in a state where we don't educate, so um, I went in for a uh, for an exam for a Pap smear, like you do every year, and I haven't been in longer than is required than is uh, you know suggested. Please go every year. <laughs> I haven't been in a while, um, and when I went in, they found. Um, a place that they wanted a biopsy. I had to go back in. I had the colposcopy. They did the biopsy and the biopsy came back and I do not have cervical cancer. <laughs> I do not have cervical cancer, thankfully. Um, but I do have, I did have um, a space of really high risk cells, which for those of you who don't know, means that if you have high risk cells that basically if you leave them alone long enough, they will become cancer. And I was very fortunate that it's not on the inside of my cervix, on the interior of my cervix, it's surface only. And so I went in for what is called a LEAP procedure. Um, it's called different things in different places. Anyway, basically what that means is that um, they uh, cut out the cells out of your cervix. So I had that done yesterday. It was mildly, they, they numb you and everything. You don't feel anything. It's, it's fine. Um, but they cut it out and they uh, cauterize and whatever. So uh, I had a little bit not discomfort. I think it was more I was afraid I was going to have discomfort. I really, um, anybody who's ever had an IUD put in or, um, you know, you get a pap smear and then after you're done, like nothing really hurts, but you're just kind of uncomfortable maybe. I don't know. Anyways, I had a little bit of that for a couple hours yesterday. Um, and she just told me, take it easy and you go back to work tomorrow. So which means I am back perfectly fine today and I am totally expecting everything to hurt or something to go wrong. And I'm like, kind of kind of ginger I'm fine I can't feel it nothing everything's fine so um you know three week recovery no no sex no fun times nothing like that you know so I have to I have to be good which sucks because quarantine <laughs> but um anyway the uh 
I had that done yesterday. Uh, so kind of the stress of that and then being a week off of having to uh, put down my dog and, uh, you know, quarantine and we weren't sure, we're not sure what's going to happen. And COVID-19, y'all, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I hope that y'all's, sorry, I got distracted and I was looking because it's pretty. Anyway, I hope that y'all's um, social distancing is going well, or as well as can be expected. Um, I hope that the people around you are are diligent and are allowing you and encouraging you to be diligent. Um, it's been a real struggle for my husband's family. They're used to doing everything together, and we're used to seeing each other all the time. And um, except for the time that we lived in Idaho. This is the longest I've gone without seeing my husband's family. Uh, I think it's been like two weeks, <laughs> three weeks now. Usually we get together on an almost weekly basis. Um, definitely every two weeks, if not, if not that. You know, but there's always, somebody always has something going on. You know, there's mom and dad and five siblings. And then now there's four grandkids. I mean, there's somebody always has something. Um, and because we are fortunate enough to have the largest home Pretty much everybody comes here so it's been really quiet my house has stayed clean for a really long time i don't really know what to do with it uh so i'm getting a lot of knitting done uh, as evidenced by the four works in progress when i normally only have two and i'm not saying i'm getting any progress made on those but the uh rhythm of rib and stockinette has been really great i don't have to think about anything which is why my cable sweater has not been cast on yet i know once i get stuck into it that'll be really rhythmic and really meditative but um, getting started has been something i just keep putting off for no real apparent reason um i also never get gauge i'm a looser knitter apparently and i never get so, um, not a big deal, just kind of deciding on where I want to go from there and whether or not I want to knit the size bigger or if I just want to like have a smaller one, if it'll work itself out, whatever. Normally I knit with super wash yarn and I find that if I, even if I'm, even if my, uh, project is going to be smaller because I'm a looser knitter, like lengthwise, especially like it will end up locking out. It'll be fine. Um, but Brooklyn Tweed is not super wash, so... Trying to make sure that I make allowances for that. I don't have anything else, but I don't really have anything to do when I get off of here either, so. I'm trying to find a way of leading this where it's not on sad things. I feel like we've lost a lot of energy because of that. And we did. We did, not gonna lie. That's all I've got. Be kind. Um, take care of yourself. Stay safe. Maybe Google and see if there's any way that you can um, contribute or participate in an appreciation for the local healthcare workers in your area. They or grocery store workers or essential personnel. These people are very much taken for granted and highly underappreciated in our society. And it would be really great to see an outpouring of support for them. You know, I was thinking about that the other day. You know, you see all these things on um, Instagram, you know. Uh, in Italy, the, a group of nuns went on top of their church and set up a microphone and sang hymns to the city of Rome. Um, the police in Spain, maybe? are driving through the towns uh, with a guitar attached to their CB system and are playing songs for people in their doorways. And uh, the UK has had a couple of times where they've all gone outside to, uh, to clap for their uh, healthcare providers at certain times. And things that I look at and I'm like, I don't know if that would ever happen in America or if that would be appreciated in America. You know, our society just isn't I don't know if our society, is it that our society isn't as community oriented? Like, what is it? Why is it that we don't do stuff like that? Or that we look at things like that and kind of roll our eyes and think that that's kind of childish or. It seems to me that. I'm just going to say it. It seems to me that as America and the greatest country in the world that we would have handled this better than we have. And I'm sure I'm not the only one thinking it. So we're all thinking it. I just said it. 
I know there's a lot of information going on around right now, and there's a lot of conflicting information, it seems. Um, I have a rant really quick that I'm just going to share with you. Uh, one of my cousins, who lives in a very rural, tiny town, Minnesota, posted a Twitter post referencing a New York Times article. And the Twitter post, I don't remember who wrote it, um, because he's ignorant, basically said, this is why the South lost the war. And then the New York Times had done an article talking about when people stopped traveling more than two miles. And it says the 21st of March, the 28th of March, the 26th of March, and it hasn't happened yet or something. And so all of these red spaces for the people who are still traveling over two miles are centered directly in the Deep South. Now, I have a thing about this. I understand that the guy who wrote This is Why the South Lost the War thinks he's being funny. Like, I get that. But I feel like the New York Times was really irresponsible for posting something like that simply because the North tends to be tinier communities, lots of distance in between them. People are a lot more a tiny packed. Or... There are bigger cities, bigger hubs, like New York City. I find it really ironic that the New York Times, where in the Bronx, 379 people died in one night, has turned around and said that traveling more than two miles is what's causing this disease to spread. You realize that if you travel two miles out of the Bronx, in a lot of ways, you leave the Bronx. Like, New York City just isn't, none of the boroughs are that big. New York City itself is just not that big. And you don't have to travel two miles to do anything because that's a subway ride. Like, you would legitimately take public transportation to get there because it's, that's far in a place like New York. Now, my nearest grocery store, my nearest gas station, my nearest anything, I mean, my nearest gas station is over a mile from my house. My nearest grocery store is four and a half to almost five. I don't have a choice but to go more than two miles. And I find it just really strange because I think that people who don't live in the South don't realize how spread out we are. Even our metropolitan areas, our hubs, our cities, you are you have to have a car in the majority of places. You can't walk. We are not a walkable region, I guess is a good way of putting that. Like, you know, I live in Houston and I don't live in Houston. I live in a town outside of Houston, but still it's, if I didn't have a car, I would be spending a lot of my day walking, you know, and it, uh, I just thought it was a really irresponsible way to demonstrate the spread of people who are endangering this country. Um, and so I kind of wanted to put a PSA up here for any of you who don't live in the South or have, don't know anything about the U.S. Um, we are very dependent upon highways here. Uh, we don't, we might have small towns, but the majority of the small towns that we have, a lot of them won't have a grocery store or they'll have like a little convenience mart or whatever, but the actual grocery store is probably in the town over, which is like five miles away, six miles away, 10 miles away, whatever. Uh, it is absolutely, uh, when I was joking earlier in the podcast about um, Josh having to come an hour to my house to get this sweater, I'm absolutely not kidding. It takes me 45 minutes to, in the most direct route possible to get from my house to the yarn store that I knit for. Um, but I would still call it Houston. Uh, I live in Cyprus. They live in Montgomery. We're literally pretty much a straight shot from one another, but there's no direct way to get there. There's no highway that hits it. There's no nothing. You have to take some back roads. Um, Houston stretches a set of, several times, 100 miles by 100 miles, you guys. Um, it takes tons of time. I t my in-laws live... 16 miles, 18 miles for me, something like that. It takes us like 25 minutes, almost 30 to get there. That's using interstate. Like that's using toll roads. <laughs> that's going 75 miles an hour, you know? So I just feel like um, any of you who don't live in the South or whatever, uh, please don't let that become a thing where you blame the South and you think that we're all ignorant and don't know what we're doing. Um, for our size, 7 million people, um, Houston has a really low amount of cases. Um, I agree that people on the beach in Florida are probably a little bit more to blame than, probably a little bit more to blame than the rest of us. We'll just put it that way, okay? <laughs> 
anyway, um, I guess when you have grown up in the South and you live in the South, uh, you know, we tend to be the brunt of a lot of jokes and that's fine. You know, uh, we're ten we are thought to be very slow, mildly unintelligent, lots of uh, Republican support for not the right reasons. Um, and some of those stereotypes tend to be true, but a lot of them are just that they are stereotypes. So uh, before you sit in your chair in the middle of Ohio and make fun of the Deep South, um, please don't. <laughs> By the way, congrats to Ohio. I was reading an article saying that uh, they're actually doing it right. Like they're they're actually having their cases are lowering very uh, substantially, which is fantastic. And Ireland, Ireland is doing fantastic on uh, flattening the curve, which is great. Um, I wish that we, as such a powerful nation, would have uh, had better responses and handled the situation better. But um, I suppose that now that it's done, all we can really do is try to get through it. So yeah, here's to getting, here's to getting through it any way that we have to, right? Um, yeah, I'm officially out. I'm officially out of stuff to talk about. I just like talking to you apparently, so I'm just gonna sit here. Um, has anybody started yard work yet? We were doing, we were trying to check our sprinkler system the other day because again, we live in a place where you have to have, you have to have water. Um, Try and check our sprinkler system the other day, and um, Texas is very uh, well known for St. Augustine grass. I don't know if anybody else has it. I know that up in north, it's usually not. It's like Bermuda or something. Bermuda grass, and most grasses, one stalk. Just, just grows up. St. Augustine is special. It has stalks, but then it also like vines across the surface of the dirt, and then like comes up in tufts. It's a little weird. It makes really, really plush, lovely, beautiful grass, but it's... Um, sprinkler heads get stuck because they're supposed to raise up, right? Well, whenever one of these vines, they don't have a lot of forceful power. So if there's a vine over it, it just holds it down. And then like entire sections of my sprinkler system don't work. <laughs> so me and my husband spend an embarrassingly long amount of time this past weekend walking through our yard, trying to figure out where the sprinkler head is. One of my stations won't come up. It was working fine and now it's not. So obviously there's something on top of one of the sprinkler heads, but we can't remember where the last sprinkler head is and so we spent an embarrassingly long amount of time in our yard trying to find the sprinkler. <laughs> my, my son thinks we're crazy. Why are we digging in the yard? <laughs> Anybody remember like honey I shrunk the kids and like he lost his kids in his backyard so he's on that sling with a magnifying glass like going around and around trying to find these kids. <laughs> I felt like that was us trying to find the sprinkler system. Um yeah we did a bunch of yard work. I have a rose bush over here in the corner and you're supposed to prune roses in, in the winter, like whenever they stop blooming. But I promise you this thing blooms like once a month. We have one good cold snap and all of a sudden there's flowers everywhere. So I don't ever have a chance to prune it. Does anybody know anything about roses? Like what do I do here? Um, I want a tree in my backyard. We're the cable and internet hub for the five houses around us or whatever. So I'm not sure if I, I'm positive I'm not allowed to dig. I'm sure HOA will have a cow. Um, I gotta figure out how to put a, put a um, tree in my backyard so they can have a tree right here and it will filter the pretty light that comes in and it'll always be the perfect lighting for podcasting. You have a tree in the front that needs to come down. It's not really a tree, it's an oversized bush. I don't know how to describe it. Anyway, that has to come down because it's rotting and it just keeps dropping random limbs on our yard. Um, I want to replace it with a magnolia because I'm that southerner. We have a very chubby, cheeky little squirrel in my front yard. And my neighbor's cat thinks it's really funny to try to chase him, but she doesn't even like go for the tree. She basically just like jumps on the tree and then jumps back off. She won't even climb up after him. I think she just likes watching him run. I have a nesting pair of doves in my neighbor's yard, which is really great. So I get to hear them all the time. It's fantastic. Brings back lots of childhood memories. And I follow an Instagram account called The Daily James. And it's um, a gentleman in LA whose backyard is basically an animal sanctuary. And he has a nesting pair of ravens named James and Margaret. And he uh, posts about them quite frequently. I really like ravens. Um, I'm a very, very big Corvid fan. I think they're incredibly intelligent animals. and They're absolutely gorgeous. 
Um, so now I want a pair of nesting ravens in my yard. <laughs> not, I'm not going to get them. I don't even know if we have, I haven't seen a raven. I've seen a bunch of blackbirds, but I haven't seen anything bigger than blackbird. No crows or anything, so. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to let you go. That way you can get back on with your day. Instead of sitting here watching me ponder the universe. So, ponder the universe responsibly. Turn it off when you need to. Uh, stay safe. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Be kind to each other. To yourselves. Be kind to yourselves. And when you're sick of them, send your kids outside, man. They'll be fine. Send them to play video games. Let them go do something other than bother you for five minutes. Yeah, parenting and safety tips. You're welcome. <laughs> Happy weekend, you guys. See you later.